Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you to Franchise CXO Dialogue. Uh, this series involves learning from thought leaders at leading franchise organizations. Hope you all are keeping safe and healthy. My name is Ashita Marya, and I'm the CEO for Franchise India. I'm very excited today to welcome Mr. Soham Choksi. He's the co-founder at Chipsy, uh, an IIT alumni, uh, is a proactive, young, and a very enterprising individual. Um, after his uh, tenure at uh, Deutsche Bank, in addition to clearing two levels of uh, CFA, uh, he started a company by the name of Mapo and uh, sold that company in June 2015 prior to starting Shipsy. Um, he founded Shipsy along with one of his batchmates, uh, Dhruv Agarwal, um, you know, who's another co-founder at Shipsy, to bring in a unique change in logistics industry with the use of technology, data, and AI uh, at a different scale. Uh, in the initial year of business, Soham himself used to deliver some packages to the customers. And uh, under his leadership, uh, Shipsy has raised three rounds of funding till date, and the latest being from InfoEdge in a pre-series A funding. Shipsy now works with both uh, domestic and international flights and has about 8% of total Indian trade being done from uh, Shipsy's platform. Uh, we also have with us Mr. Gaurav Marya, who's the chairman of Franchise India. Uh, who's being one of uh, the highly uh, regarded, uh, you know, professionals in this industry for his contribution in popularizing franchising at large. Um, so, I would like to, uh, you know, start with you. I understand that, you know, Shipsy is one of the, uh, you know, fastest growing uh, company in terms of providing SaaS to, uh, you know, uh, supply chain industry and uh, being one of the, you know, uh, founding members. I mean, pretty much it was your idea. Um, so, why don't you just, you know, kind of take us through the highlight of last five years uh, of your journey there? Yeah, yeah sure. So, uh, uh, see, um, uh, thanks a lot for the background, uh, Ashara, and the introduction. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, at the highest level, why logistics and why now? Why supply chain? Why is there, you know, so many people talking about logistics and supply chain all of a sudden? Uh, see, the idea is that uh, over the last five, six, seven years, right, uh, uh, we've had a large and tremendous change in, you know, customer expectations, right? The end customer, the individual, the buyer, each one of us, right? Our expectations has gone uh, for, uh, you know, has gone, grown leaps and bounds compared to what it was before. Uh, but if we see the logistics supply chain industry, uh, right, uh, there's still... Uh, kind of, uh, you know, in terms of tech enablement, this is still quite far behind. And what that means is that while the customer experience expectation is here, uh, the capability of delivering those expectations still needs vast amount of improvement. Uh, so think about it this way that, you know, Amazon, for example, their biggest differentiator today is their ability to, be, to deliver fast and deliver cheap, right? And that's what's gotten them the lion's share in the market, right? Now, imagine if uh, that kind of technology can be uh, um, kind of given uh, everywhere, uh, democratized, right? Uh, so that was the whole idea that why can't we do that? And uh, uh, essentially, because of this changing nature of the customer, there's been a bull whip effect across the supply chain right, at the highest levels as well. Uh, because of which now everyone has to look at lead times. Everyone has to look at inventory levels right, with COVID and all. So people have realized that, you know, inventory levels, maintaining those is also super important. So the idea really is, is that logistics uh, supply chain currently is uh, super exciting. There's a lot of activity happening. And uh, we started off actually as a first mile aggregator, right? So we said that, why don't we go to end customers and give them this platform where they could send anything anywhere. And while we realized that while that was a good problem to solve, right, the bigger problem was the fact that all of the service providers that are there, they needed better technology uh, to actually deliver uh, these goods, right? So we said that why don't we actually start working with the logistics companies, uh, the customers of logistics companies to kind of help them with the technology platform that we built for ourselves. So that's been our journey. We started off working with logistics companies. Then we went to, uh, you know, customers of logistics companies like pharma companies, auto companies for, you know, giving them visibility across their domestic logistics partners. Uh, then we saw that there's also international movement that's there. Uh, right. So then we got into international freight and, uh, you know, we work across uh, large customers, uh, mid-size SMEs. We work on all levels, right. Uh, and our product is kind of plug and fit. 
so yeah, the idea is how can we help each one of these people reduce their costs, improve the customer experience, and really gear up for uh, you know the higher expectations from customers. So yeah, I think that's a summary of uh, a journey. Sure, I think it was rightly said, and I, this was a very fragmented uh, market, and suddenly the demand and and this is a sunshine sector now, and you are the right time, right place, and being still a technology company, not really taking the the toughness okay. of the physical logistics. So you really uh, have a softer part of it. So yeah. uh, if you have to really see through this industry while you're trying to solve a lot of issues, uh, yeah. you know, building, reducing cost, I think, uh, bringing more efficiency, driving more integration. Uh, real-time inventory issues, a lot of these uh, problems which are you doing and also in you know, a fragmented aggregation itself, you know, a, a single provider were working with multiple yeah, yeah, operators. Yeah. What would be still the most biggest problem still to be addressed in the logistic market in India? And what would be probably your your next two years gateway to really address uh, that? So uh, let's, let's put the, uh, you know, uh, quintessential exporter at the center of it all, right? So let's say uh, an SME, right? What is their aspiration today? Their aspiration is that how can they go above and beyond, right? Go deliver beyond just the Indian market, maybe go uh, uh, international, right? Start exporting. Now think about yourself as a mid-sized company like who wants to export. How would you do it? Uh, right? It's a huge problem, uh, right? There's a bunch of paperwork that you need to know about. Typically, most people stop after one bad experience, right? They'll send one container and they'll have some hidden charges that come up from somewhere. They'll realize that the cost of freight has erased off all of the margins. And so then they'll just stop exporting again, right? So if I were to say, what is the biggest problem and what is uh, going to add tremendous value is if we can empower each and every SME in the country to start, uh, you know, growing their international business by helping them really reduce the costs, navigate through all of the processes, documentation, customs filings, all of those things otherwise, in a very transparent manner, right? So that they know what they're signing up for. See, problem in logistics is that the transparency isn't there, right? You get one price at the start and then at the end, they're like, okay, this, 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 there are a bunch of other charges that come, right? So, and which... Which, which basically, you know, imagine if you went on Amazon and you bought something and it said that we'll decide the price later, uh, right? You wouldn't buy it. Right? So uh, that's basically what uh, is the kind of transparency and trust that we need to build uh, with these people. Yeah, very well said. I think that's where the real opportunity is. And India was actually 15, 20 years behind in this uh, look at the country, yeah. uh, especially China and other. If you look at China, exactly. You look at China, how they have uh, grown by leaps and, and see, it's not just the large companies. There's a fat tail, huge fat tail. Like in India, there are about 7 uh, lakh uh, uh, IEC codes, right? Import exporter codes, right? And out of which even 2 lakh are active on a quarterly basis, right? So it's a huge number we're talking about. And by active means shipping at least one container. Uh, right, and the container is like a 44, 20 foot container. Uh, goods itself would in that would be like hundred thousand dollars, right? So, the the tail is phenomenally fat, right? It's not just concentrated at the top, uh, right? So, uh, and that's the beauty of it, right? If there can be one platform that can actually democratize this, right? Yeah. See, large people, anyways, have good access, right? They have different problems. Like a large importer would say, or, or a large exporter rather would have a different kind of problem. Right, that okay, they're already doing it, but how can they improve their efficiency? Right, by really automating, digitizing, creating a platform, software, and uh, you know, ensuring that the dependence on uh, you know uh, manual things reduces. So that there, that's their problem. But if you look at the quintessential SME, their problem is very different. That you know, how can we start? Right, that's the idea. Absolutely, and I you rightly said, and I've studied myself in a lot of work in done in China, and especially places like EU. If you go there and you, you find these small, small, small manufacturers uh, and earlier they used to be a peak 20 years back, they would not take up orders because they need MOQs and things like that. Because of sophistication and the technology and, and integrated logistics, now they pick up as small as half a container orders and things that exactly we picked in the morning. By afternoon, they know exact pictures will start coming in, where the shipping is gone, where the truck has reached, how it is loaded and what is in transition. Everything is seamless. And because it means seamless, it creates a huge amount of opportunity for these smaller players to really look at global marketplaces. And India, the problem with manufacturing is that everybody is not optimized 
and they are running on lesser on efficiency somebody is running 30% 40% just because they are lack on tiring and just capability of b2b marketing would not do that i think what you are trying to address is a much bigger problem uh, which everybody was absolutely and if we can empower them help them do more business i think uh, that's a, a phenomenal place to be in absolutely and and that's where and you do you think in bilateral trade and when you talked about the export part of it and which is very interesting and nobody else is really talking about that and uh, what needs to be done which are the markets which you really to see any any clusters or any windows you've really seen like india gcc big bilateral trade or any other oh. market where you really building up that portfolio yeah so uh, i think see with uh, uh, it's actually certain sectors really that are really outperforming and there's a reason for that right see with uh, everything that has happened around covid uh, right people have realized that uh, you know dependency on china has to reduce uh, right and that is where the number one place people are coming to is india uh, right post that right and in special sectors like if you see specialty chemicals for example right that's booming uh, right why because a lot of that market has shifted to india if you see pharma right because see all of these are very specialty markets and india excels in these things hai na so there are certain markets like this where india is really like if you see auto right now auto you see the kind of exports how it has grown right yeah. some of our customers even the larger ones right like uh, even the india's largest petrochem company etc their exports have grown 3x right so the idea really is in all of these specific sectors there has been you know huge growth now if you talk about uh, uh, you know like let's say port pairs right or in which uh, countries is it larger yes a uh, us is one place where people are actively trying right to expand into the us market but because if you see a uh, us the maximum dependence was from china right in terms of their imports right and that they're trying to you know kind of just you know ensure that it gets divided and the market is so huge in us that even a fraction coming to india is yeah, 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 yeah. is is, is uh, good for the company so it's a mix of certain specific sectors that are really outperforming plus certain geographies to where uh, you know the demand and the dependence on china was high and that has kind of shifted to india so in in sme the problem is that how do you really educate and especially these clusters exactly. so, so what is what has been done at your end in terms of educating them and getting them on board getting them getting them used to the platform and how they really sure. uh, so so we have uh, multiple things see actually for all of the people that are there on our platform we have a dedicated content team also that uh, you know sends out so we have a full knowledge uh, team right that keeps sending out this information right um there are also very special things like let's say there are uh, certain port pairs between which the rates have really fallen see ocean freight is a very dynamic market right it depends on it, there are so many things that drive it trump will say something and the ocean freight will go down <laughs> right because the demand supply thing changes right it depends on crude prices right so the point is there are a lot of different things that drive these prices right so let's say that between certain port pairs the price have really fallen right which means that okay let's say their customer let's say that was in germany right and let's say if the prices let's say to hamburg have reduced so now they can further flash that to their customers and become more competitive over there so that is point number 1 that you know in terms of these kind of cost variations or you know uh, you know if there are uh, i would say any uh, places where the costs have really reduced and where they can pass on those discounts to the customers because if freight anything you say on freight finally i mean you can give pass it on to the customer and become more competitive so that is point number 1 point number 2 is in the process itself see uh, our platform is very comprehensive that based on the nature of the goods the platform itself suggests that what all documentation is required right who is the best uh, you know let's say freight forwarder to work with who has a lot of experience in this uh, uh, particular yeah. trade so it is uh, you know the system really defines all of those things right that uh, knowing all of that that this is exactly what you need to do so rather than you know making a call to an agent that agent saying ki acha aapko ye 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 karna hai right you cannot trust that right so now the point is once everything is in the system uh, it is driven by that right and then you have the freight forwarders collaborating over there the shipper has complete visibility of what is happening all of the prices so uh, those are the few things i believe uh, uh, that are helpful and that we're doing right now in terms of helping these smes kind of gear up uh, for uh, the you know international trade sure very helpful ashita yeah so what would be the percentage of your clients uh, you know for these 
SMEs versus the you know so-called bigger companies currently? Uh, in terms of numbers, so overall we have about uh, 500 plus around 600 active customers. So in terms of numbers, of course, SMEs is the biggest number. Uh, right, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of uh, of course our revenue, because see what we have done actually is we have made the SME product free right now, uh, right. Mm -hmm. So up to a certain limit of containers, it is free, uh, right, where they can use it, uh, discover uh, freight forwarders. So uh, you know, in that way, we are actually trying our best to kind of help them out uh, from that front, and we have a full dedicated network team that is kind of looking after. Uh, you know, going to as many SMEs as possible. So we're trying to tie up with uh, the trade associations, uh, right? Trying to help them disseminate this information to their, uh, you know, SMEs. Each one's like, you know, textile, car, there is something different. This thing, chemicals, there is something different. Auto, there's a different uh, apex body. So, you know, kind of trying all these different things to ensure that we can reach as many people uh, as possible. So to answer your question, uh, yes, of course, in terms of numbers, SMEs is large. But since it's a premium kind of product where the SMEs typically follow the free range, um, right? most of our revenue actually comes from the larger customers that are looking for more of efficiencies. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, understandably, uh, it's, a, it's a, a pretty young venture, uh, you know, yeah. right now. It's yeah. been about, what, five years. Yeah. And um, there's a very interesting story behind how did you raise your seed fund? You know, so want to, <laughs> want to really hear about that. Yeah, yeah, so it's been a very interesting uh, uh, journey. I would say that, see, uh, there are a lot of opportunities out there, right? And you need to, you try a hundred things, two will work out, uh, right? Or one will work yeah. out. So, uh, what is in your hand is trying, right? And you never know what will come your way. So, uh, you know, and that has happened multiple times, right? So, uh, that was a pretty interesting story. So, for our angel round, uh, uh, you know, see, back in the day when we were doing operations, so... Uh, you know, we had a lot of customers and they were also learning about the product. And we had this one particular seller uh, who kind of exchanged the addresses of the packages, right? Like Delhi to Noida and Noida to Delhi. So, uh, the Noida one went to Delhi, Delhi one went to Noida. And the, <laughs> the seller, she was very, you know, disturbed, right? So, uh, we said that, okay, we'll help you out, right? And it was a Sunday. So, I decided that, you know, I'll go myself, I'll take the metro and I'll uh, see what, uh, you know, how I can, you know, maybe retrieve that. Uh, so, I was on the metro and then kind of uh, uh, saw this uh, one uh, kid who was there. I said that, okay, you have a seat uh, and, uh, um, yeah, you know, it's fine. Yeah, you'll be comfortable. Um, then uh, I was wearing the Shipsy t-shirt. So, his father basically started talking to me that he's from UK. And, uh, uh, you know, he's kind of just showing around on the metro, things like that. And he got very interested. He, was, uh, he had a hedge fund over there uh, and had recently started angel investing in India as well. So, uh, he got very interested and yeah, so kind of closed the first round on the metro. So, that's, uh, uh, that was the story over there. Uh, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, the initial venture uh, that I had, uh, found a buyer for that also through him. So, a lot of things kind of uh, happened. So, I kind of sold that as well, got some uh, self-funded money also uh, to get into the company. So, uh, yeah, it was a pretty interesting journey that and then how we kind of pivoted from the operations to the SaaS model, uh, right? Because see, uh, uh, if you see most of the ops guys that were there, like the hyperlocal, most of them, I mean, it's not a sustainable model, right? It's a high cash burn model. And a lot of them, unfortunately, are not surviving right now as well, right? So, uh, but, you know, that time we were using some of these people. So, we just got sent about 100 messages on LinkedIn. Uh, five people responded, got one meeting, you know, told them that, look, this is the thing that we have to offer. Uh, and that's how we got our anchor customer, DGDC Express, uh, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, by just telling them about the story that look, we used you, this is the places where we can really help improve customer experience. And, you know, they have a very young, energetic leader also. Uh, so they kind of understood the vision, mission. So, yeah, a lot of uh, interesting uh, stories, I guess, uh, behind, uh, uh, you know, our start and how we have grown. All, all the uh, good stories start like that. You know, people are, I think the first <laughs> believers, you get it. You know, they're opinion yeah. makers and they, they see into a founder. And yeah. they actually don't see too much into the opportunity. They have no wisdom to see a moot opportunity. Angels are always about people who yeah. see into a founder. So they're good yeah. at seeing the founder. Yeah. So I think uh, that's what they're, maybe institutional value or something which they always want to do. Yeah. And they are normally at the date because they know that somebody has to do it for them. You know, that's why... Yeah. Uh, so, so this is how yeah. 
this works best absolutely uh, absolutely yeah. and where is the where is the next goal coming for you i mean what is the next big uh, opportunity and uh, uh, so i guess see, we recently started our sme module uh, you know to be honest uh, during this covid period itself where we saw a huge need for these smes to kind of go above and beyond so that network module is something uh, yeah, yeah so that's the whole network piece uh, for the smes and kind of replicating that for middle east southeast asia those markets so yeah that's our next uh, step and uh, adding a lot more services so right now there's ocean freight uh, we're adding trucking uh, to it so we want to get on board a network of uh, trucking uh, service providers also on the platform uh, then insurance brokers uh, and also trade finance uh, right so those are some of the additional um, uh, things that you know everyone needs right so any sme they need all of these services so we want to try to add all of these different service on the platform so that it becomes like a comprehensive um uh, you know offering for uh, them for you know managing all of their business yeah sure so and then with trucking coming in and all insurance coming in this would become fully integrated you know so exactly. that's the whole point right to cover all the different aspects absolutely absolutely and and now you're also looking for for partners to come on board who would who would be part of your you know capabilities of final distribution and facilitation of a your uh, um, what a system in, uh, implementation at different location or different clusters. So there are two kinds of partners. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two kinds of partners that we are uh, looking at, right? See, first is that can uh, uh, help. Uh, I mean, that we can uh, kind of partner with uh, to uh, onboard more customers, uh, right? Uh, and on a revenue sharing basis, right? So there is a huge opportunity where whether it be large enterprises, small enterprises, mid-sized enterprises, uh, everyone needs software to scale, right? And the beauty is it is a recurring revenue, right? So let's say you sign up an account, which is $2,000 a month, uh, right? Um, so there's a revenue sharing and it keeps going on and on. You close it once by virtue of the platform being very strong, the company is retained on it and they keep paying, right? It's like Netflix, you, you know, 500 rupees just go from your account every month, uh, right? You don't even realize it, right? So. Uh, that's the whole beauty of SaaS, right? That it keeps coming. And uh, the good part is that we're sharing all of the variable revenues as well. It's not just the setup fee. We're sharing the re variable revenue. So that is one part, right? And we have a huge uh, set of target customers that we can acquire um, uh, in India and, of course, in other places as well. But yeah, um, that is one part. The second is for all of the services that we're offering to SMEs. So think about it this way that we have uh, about 6,000, 7,000 odd SMEs on the platform right now, uh, right? So what are the different services we can offer to them? So ocean freight, yes. So we have about 200 odd freight forwarders, agents that are offering their services on the platform, sure. right? Now the question is, can we get on board more of those? Can we on board certain truckers? Can we on board certain insurance brokers? Can we on what all services can we on board, right? So the idea is there's this network, what all can we offer to them, uh, right? They're there, they're active on the platform, what more can we offer to them? So those are the two main things that we're honestly looking for in terms of partners. Staying on the first part of the partners, which are yeah. typically resellers, and this is a great model and I should compliment you because we've done a lot of work for even the largest of companies, the Microsofts and likes of them, where we created the reseller yes. programs. Uh, and these reseller exactly. programs were uh, one low ticket and the acquisition used to take a lot of cost of acquisition and they were only one time paid. Uh, so the problem was that they were, the resellers were not so happy because they were not getting any recurring income coming on that. So what you've done yeah. is actually the right thing. You know, if somebody say yeah. starts in Ludhiana, works hard and gets uh, say 500 different clients on boarded on the entire thing, then you have a recurring revenue, which is historically going to come from each of the client as they keep using that banking. So it can become a very interesting because India has about yeah. Uh, 800 different industry clusters and each of the cluster can have a very strong partner and each partner then can go down and, and acquire uh, these partners. So this can be a, a great opportunity. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think see, because uh, there is a huge opportunity, uh, especially like even for the SME market, right? Uh, let's say uh, we get people to onboard uh, SMEs also, uh, right? To do, uh, you know, business on the platform. See, there we earn from the freight forwarders that actually pay the commission also. So even there is a revenue opportunity over there, uh, right? So, uh, I mean, whether it be SMEs, whether it be uh, selling uh, uh, to the SMEs, because finally when the SME makes a booking, 
it's a freight forwarder that uh, you know gets the business and they yeah. share a commission with us and that's a decent commission right so which we can further share with the partner who helps us on board that sme so i think then and that is again recurring uh, right because see once someone comes on the platform they see low rates they keep making bookings through the platform right so whether it be actually selling the software uh, right or it be selling this platform for uh, you know the freight ocean freight right both of them have uh, you know good opportunities and it's recurring that's the best part it would not make sense to have the same partner in a particular cluster to do both or would not be able to do that some has one uh, it is just i i would say it's uh, ideally of course uh, you know one partner doing both helps but since it's slightly different kind of selling correct right it's correct. slightly different kind of selling so that's the only thing uh, right uh, why uh, uh i mean for us uh, it would make sense uh, for the partner if attacking both makes sense then why not because see one by virtue of it is slightly you know a uh, large size slightly large size accounts i uh, you know like an e-commerce company or a large importer large exporter uh, or a large 3pl uh, right uh, and there you're actually selling the software and the other is where you're actually telling them that look guys this is a platform you can manage all of your operation do the bookings Uh, through this platform, so it's slightly different nature over there. Not too different, uh, you know. Absolutely, something uh, that can be done uh, by one partner also, for sure. Very interesting, very interesting. I think, uh, and a, uh, one of our uh, members is asking question. Poonam is asking question that would you do the training for them to really be ready yes. for presenting that because that's of very course. important part of us. Because yeah, so we have a dedicated channel partner team uh, that does this training, uh, right? That uh, takes these sessions. and kind of helps them gear up uh, in terms of the platform so they get the login credentials of the platform so that any demo that has to be shown that can be done and all of the training that is there that can also be done so yes uh, that is part of it yeah so is there any geographical uh, rights to it you know that you say that okay if you know one partner is there located in say one area uh, somebody else uh, i mean do, do you give him exclusive rights for that area currently we don't have exclusivity per se uh right uh, right now there is no concept of exclusivity because see a lot of the customers also they are distributed across right they'll have one you know factory in one place one factory in another place so uh, typically there is no exclusivity as such defined but yes there are demarcated zones uh for each person that right? okay you will look into this zone currently we don't have the construct of exclusivity and i also feel that there should be no exclusivity because uh, fundamentally uh this is this is an opportunity of more direct sales kind of function and and one can go and reach out to as many you want to do you can also use a lot of referral programs because one company yes. would in a plot would give you a reference to another one and actually this is it would limit both sides network. you create yeah. yeah yeah it's a network see uh, actually i'll tell you uh, uh, uh god of that it does not end here see you can sit in india and sell to people in us germany everywhere right, right. now see, think of the exporter right the person on the other side is also an importer right so <laughs> that is also a potential business opportunity right that person also needs the platform that person also needs the software they need to track not just across this exporter they need to track across uh, you know 300 more of their suppliers right so that is also because see that is what we creating it's a global trade network right that this exporter brings on board say 200 of their customers so now each one of those 200 is a potential business opportunity and which is why it's a truly global thing that's why i see abhi the exclusivity and all is not aata nahi because see it's a sitting in india ludhiana guy is selling to us guy right that us I, guy is also customer i i personally right. think it is limiting at both sides and both ends it is very limiting and this should never be yeah. done and this is what reseller program for any saas company yeah, yeah. would be and it also would be that some would become very very big ones and some would yes. be marginalized only doing it that thing only person who would go all out put all the effort and create a network and be able to work and get good references can multiply this business very very big way exactly and it's just about being smart about it right see if you acquire one customer uh, and if that customer is happy you can actually get uh, you know 30 40 50 more from that one person right, uh, right? so that's the uh, beauty of it and you can keep going to them keep asking for referrals right that please introduce me to your customer they will also need it right or please uh, introduce me to your trading partner who is supplying to you because they will also be exporting importing they will be doing all of those things so 
the idea really is is that there is a uh, you know a lot of potential for uh, you know cross selling up selling as well and how big is the now the team and where is the big focus for you i mean technology still continues to be the biggest focus for you to continue to develop yes so uh, even still we have uh, so overall we are about 140 people now uh, 130 140 people we still have about 80 uh, 85 odd in uh, tech um Uh, right product design constitutes another uh, 50 20 and then we have a sales team we have direct sales uh, we have a channel partner team so that is kind of part of uh, uh, those are the main uh, four divisions and um, uh, technology will always remain a focus area for us because uh, see the idea is that the platform itself uh, right see that is the asset right see the platform is strong uh if it is able to solve the problems uh, right like you mentioned that you know what are we doing to help them see the platform is doing it to help them uh, right. what do we do as uh, people right so the platform has to be very strong and we keep adding more and more functionalities like today there is only say uh, full container loads and exports that can be done we're introducing lcls and airs right because we know that smes they don't always have fcl right they have less than container loads and they have air movements also so right. why can't we give them an opportunity to you know look at that aspect so we are constantly adding more and more things like i mentioned trucking is there there's uh, insurance those things are uh, right so uh, platform would be important however we are at that stage where uh, you know the critical mass is there right and the platform itself fundamentally it is there so we are really looking to press the pedal on the sales sure sure i think with all the already trading has started happening and people are using it now i think the yes. idea would be that more you have the more ecosystem would help each other and and it's a network yeah that is the network yeah absolutely is uh, you know the opportunity more in um, you know because currently people would not be working on any of these platforms so these partners have yeah. to what do you think have to educate them more or you know get them from you know something that they're using currently which is probably not as uh, futuristic as your product is do you think that's the one thing or you know it's more about education that we have these services and you should come on board with us uh see uh the thing is uh, it's a mix of both i'll be very honest see we are at a still at a stage where educating the customer is important right uh see uh, like if you see crm right a crm now everyone knows they have to have a crm right uh, everyone knows that why because it's been around for about 20 years right so uh, but now the same thing is happening to logistics and supply chain but we are at that kind of initial stage not too initial not too late uh, wherein uh, while most people do know that yes uh, they need to look at logistics they need to look at it as a differentiator they need to look at costs uh, all of those things uh, a bit of uh, you know i would say education that look things like this exist right why do you still want to be on emails why do you still want to be on excel why do you still want to make 10 phone calls to agents to ask for rates right we it's not required right why do we want to still do on whatsapp and um, uh, you know like for the owner a lot of times in the sme the owner gets involved the owner herself himself they get involved uh, right that what is the negotiation on the freight because a lot of times the logistics creates the margin uh, erosion or margin expansion right uh so uh, you know that is why there is a bit of education that is involved uh, but at the same time the operations they are doing see it's about doing it in a different way see it's not like that okay fine uh, you know they're not trading of course those people will be trading right or of course they are doing distribution right but it's just for doing it in a better way hmm okay all right and there is any other uh, synergetic okay, so- uh, companies also you see which are available out there which would come under you know your radar to really look at acquisition if somebody is aggregated something else uh, in the market or you feel that you still have to do a long way of aggregating one by one assets yourself i mean say there is somebody we partner all- see we partner uh, gorav uh, to be honest like say for example warehouse management so we partner with companies uh, like have that have a full solution for warehouse management uh, right and it's an integrated solution then see we may not have it ourselves but what does the customer care about customer wants an integrated solution right so those are some of the things that we do that whether uh, we build it ourselves or we integrate certain external solutions i uh, you know both are on the table 
uh, right? So, uh, but yes, uh, there are, uh, so that is part one where we are partnering. The second is that where we are also building out a lot of the capabilities, like I mentioned, bringing on trucking, uh, LCL, air, those modes. So, uh, it's a mix of both of those. Sure, sure. Oh, that's, uh, that's a very, very good point, right? Because, uh, see, I truly believe that uh, for a company uh, to scale, Right. See, beyond the point, right. See, when you're young, when you're say 20, 30, let's see even 40 people, you know, the promoters can have that iron grip, uh, right. And ensure that they themselves are talking to each one of the people. But when you go beyond that 35, 40 mark, it becomes humanly impossible to do that. And what you basically need is a set of values that represent what you stand for. Right, a set of core values that represent what you stand for. That whether you are there in the room or not, everyone knows that yes, these are the values that have the company has been built on, and this is the values that will take Shipsy to the future. Right, so we have a set of uh, seven core values uh, that really define uh, us. Uh, this is stuck everywhere. So when we were in office, it was stuck in office. It was it's pinned to our Slack channel so that everyone can see it over there. Every person who joins. The employee handbook, the first page is, you know, the core values. So, you know, that is what we do to ensure that, um, uh, you know, that culture stays, uh, right? Say something like customer obsession, right? See, we're not solving our own problem. We're always solving the problem of the customer, uh, right? So don't think of it that way that what is my problem? No, mm-hmm. nobody cares about your problem. They're all talking about the customer's problem, uh, right? So that and then... Uh, you know, frugality, uh, right? That's very important, right? So, uh, and frugality, not just in terms of money, in terms of time, uh, right? That how can you ensure that you use each person? Like if you're going into a meeting, it has to be very well prepared, uh, right? You need to, you can't waste people's time over there. So you need to be frugal. So, um, and then so a bunch of these core values, right? So that's typically what we use to kind of ensure that everyone remains aligned. And it's very difficult, you know, as you go look, keep going larger, then it becomes even more difficult. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, if you, yeah, yeah. and especially if you and do... And actually, the point is, Gaurav, that uh, see, in office, in a physical environment, you can still do that. You can just walk up to someone in the cafeteria, have a chat with them, uh, right, and get to know the pulse of the organization. Correct. Right. Correct. But in a work-from-home scenario, it's very difficult, uh, right, to know what is going on in people's minds, what are they thinking about, what are they worried about, what are their concerns? What would make them happy? What would keep them satisfied? I think uh, so that makes it a little tougher in a work from home environment to be able to do that. And it requires a different set of strategies, uh, right? To be able to kind of uh, make it successful even in this environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you guys are back in the offices? Or are you still uh, working from different okay. locations? <laughs> okay. uh, still working from home. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, we do have our office and uh, we still have all of those contracts in place, but we're not really uh, using. Um, I go maybe once or twice a week uh, and that's a bit for meeting a lot of the senior people, senior managers to kind of discuss on strategy related points. Uh, but uh, we don't really see any, like see, even when we were in office, uh, everything was on Slack. Everything was on conference, Jira, uh, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's all anyways like that. A lot of our customers are international. Uh, right. So we, we serve them from here. So, uh, the idea is that we were kind of inherently geared for work from home and office was, you know, where people used to interact, uh, catch up with each other, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, stress busting sessions. So all of those things, uh, which you kind of miss, but, uh, yeah, given that it's still not very safe, uh, you know, we're kind of avoiding, uh, seeing that, uh, taking things as it comes and, uh, after this, it'll be a mix of both. It will become a mix of both. People would buy it. Would. Also like with that. And it would. Not- it would. It would. So, what I have actually mentioned to the team is that see, even when we do open, uh, it would be either the full team is in office or the full team is working from home. Right? See, because what happens, the problem is that is if three members in the team are home, four members are in office. Right? So, you're running a call, four people in front, three over there. Uh, right, so that becomes <laughs> difficult. But if it's 50 50, let's say the whole team in office or whole team working from home. So that is good. That is fine. So, and that is what ensures that at any given point of the time, across all of your teams, basically 50% workforce will be in office, which creates the social distancing. It creates all of those things as well. And um, uh, basically, yeah, that collaboration still doesn't break. 
correct correct absolutely that's where a value really comes in true so i think that's what uh, uh, you know i i like uh, reading robert felix on that and that's what he says that you know the choices that you make uh, in any given condition actually defines uh, you know the culture and the strategy uh, in every perspective and that flows uh, you know from uh, up to down so i think yeah that's what you know the changes uh, so people reflect on that uh, you know so your teams yeah. would reflect on that exactly yeah, so, yeah that's something that's which is very interesting so how yeah. uh, i'm sure you know you would be you would be looking for um, you know customer servicing and you know their feedbacks but what uh, you know what uh, uh, defines uh, in the company to uh, do that or what encourages you to do that and what is it that you would like to achieve uh, you know as a as a satisfactory uh, level in terms of servicing customers sure so uh, see of course uh, we have uh, uh, you know a bunch of uh, defined metrics a standard stuff right but see uh, the point really is is that how do you drive that in as a culture uh, right that customer servicing and making sure that the customer is happy at all costs right uh, no excuse is given right see that is something that comes from the top that you know what happens is a lot of times there would be that okay maybe certain there are a bunch of tickets that have piled up so there will be a time where all senior people will be like let's leave everything that we're doing let's just focus on making sure that all of our backlog and tickets has been cleared uh, right so that you know the customer should never suffer right so the point is internally between the teams yes we could suffer you know somebody has to do someone else's job somebody else to do someone else's job to fill in but the customer can never suffer so i think um, uh, you know one is the softer aspect like this that i spoke about of course the harder aspects is we have very defined metrics slas uh, that we have for customers like uh, for p1 tickets p2 tickets p3 tickets p4 tickets uh, the exact number of hours in which we have to respond uh, and we use uh, jira as a tool to ensure that uh, you know all the slas can be tracked by the customer internally and all of the metrics are there so it's a mix of both the softer and the harder aspects absolutely and then once you sure, because having something on that then i think everybody starts following that it's actually early yes. stage when you implement this you know i've really realized yeah. that a lot of companies and especially in startups i've realized they they go a life cycle and then they start implementing it doesn't come there easy easy no no it has to be from the start it has yeah, to be has from to the be. start uh see that's the thing about you know product companies in india i feel that uh, we uh, honestly have a lot to learn from our global counterparts right when it comes to customer servicing and support right i uh, see it's not about acquiring a customer uh, right it is about retaining that customer because one happy customer will give you 30 other customers on the other hand one unhappy customer will also end up that you don't you can take away all, <laughs> all the customers happiness, your happiness and, and also your customers happiness they will take all the happiness absolutely out. absolutely so uh, you know i think see that is where we need to be more uh, 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 i would say long term thinking right to ensure that uh, you know fine we may not be able to acquire five new customers but if we retain the yep. existing 10 customers the new customers will come themselves right and uh, um and the trust stays on yeah yeah absolutely i stop any last comments yeah. from the side is just running on a Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, how did uh, the time uh, during the COVID um, happen? I mean, you were pretty much available on the Zoom calls with your team members, or you were doing something else as well? Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, actually, uh, yeah, bunch of calls and uh, see. Before that, I used to travel a lot to Middle East, and uh, being at the center of global trade. Uh, in December, January, mm-hmm. we saw that you know there was huge uh, problems coming from China. uh right the volumes had started to drop uh, there were blank sales things like that so we kind of saw it right so uh, we had actually set a lot of the processes in february itself uh, that uh, you know let's ensure that uh, so our february town hall it was that you know let's ensure that we set our weekly tasks daily tasks expectations so clearly that it does not matter where we work from uh, right so that's kind of uh, what the february town hall was about and uh, you know then march came covid hit and we're all going to work from home so see a lot of it was about setting the right processes uh, right that uh, see because for a person right if their weekly tasks and expectations are absolutely clear uh, right 
they can do and work from anywhere right so that is fine right so the difficulty is in implementing that uh, and that is kind of what uh, i was actually primarily focusing on at the start building out all of those processes and of course yeah available at all times on calls uh, just on day night weekday weekend uh, it's all like a continuum so that's i think common for all of us uh, yeah So we've uh, now yes kind of used to uh, doing more Zoom meetings than physical meetings, uh, but definitely we miss them. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I look forward to yeah. go to those uh, you know conference war rooms again very soon. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, true. So um, thank you so much. It was uh, you know great absolutely. having you here, and uh, it was great uh, in learning uh, you know so much about Chipsy and. Uh, i would say very, uh, you know much congratulations to you in 5 years uh, you know the kind of growth path uh, you've taken is uh, is commendable no thanks a lot ashita it was a pleasure uh, you know interacting with uh, yourself gorav and uh, uh, you know i think see uh, there is a huge opportunity wherever we look and i think um, uh, you know this whole environment software while the external part there's a lot of difficulties etc but i think we need to Uh, focus on the strengths and see how we can leverage the strengths and grow together. So yeah, that's I think what it's about. So happy to kind of uh, uh, you know engage uh, later on and see what else we can do. Sure, look forward absolutely. And we have a large ecosystem at Franchise India for people looking for opportunities. This can be a huge opportunity for people to become partner with absolutely. you. Absolutely, we'll, we'll reach out. Right, right. Thanks, thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Gaurav. Thanks, Ashutosh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.